reaching Poway, PQ, RB, Scripps Ranch, and Escondido. We're just expanding, and uh, it is just God's favor. And uh, and so, before we introduce Mark and have him come up and preach, uh, there's just so, the Lord is doing so much. It's just hard to get it all in one service. But I'm going to ask Josh to come back up, our worship pastor. Didn't Josh do a great job for us? And uh, here's another testimony of God's favor. Yeah, so um, you guys have, you know when you're in the, the flow of God's favor, you can kind of sense something going on. There seems to be, what I've recognized is that there's less resistance, you know? You don't have to push his heart to get things done. It yeah. seems like God is just like, all right, I'm putting angels just to go before you, just start weed whacking all the stuff out of your way. So your rough places are now smooth, right? So I've been praying and, and up for increase, I've been, like I've been saying during worship, for abundance, that I start to see myself as being already abundant. Because we have the Holy Spirit, because of who I am in Christ, I've been really claiming that for myself and for my family and, and, uh, and believing it. Not just saying it, but really just choosing to believe it. If God gave Jesus to me, I didn't hold any, anything back. He didn't hold his son back. Why would he hold anything back from Come me? Come on, now you're right? preaching. Now you're preaching. Come on. <laughs> Thanks, John. <laughs> you can have a seat. <laughs> now I'm just playing. Oh, okay. Anyway, so I've been praying for increase and just really proclaiming, you know what? I want to be wealthy, not just externally, but more so internally. This wealth word, W-E-L-L-T-H, wealth mentality, well within my soul, and wealth outside of me. Um, I've been really proclaiming that and affirming that, yeah, wealth is coming to me in increasing quantities, right? It will. God wants to bless me so that I can be a blessing for others. And so, a couple weeks into the year, uh, you know, just thinking, anticipating, sensing something stirring, sensing, sensing something coming, and my boss pulled me into the conference room and gave me a very significant raise in my annual salary. Very significant. To where it's gonna help us offset and pay off debt and all this kind of stuff. But all, not only that too, but I, one of my goals personally was that I'd be able to go to college and just educate myself so that I can handle and have the capacity for greater amounts of wealth and do business and, and have multiple stuff. because. That's what I want, you know, and been laying that before the Lord. And, uh, and he also offered to, uh, to compensate my college as well. So that is pretty, pretty cool. So, yeah, that sounds like favor, right? <laughs> so I just encourage you in the hearing of that testimony, believe that for yourself, too, that God is opening up the windows of heaven, pouring out so much blessing on you that you won't even have enough room to hold it. Then we'll move. This is a nice spot to be in. It's in the shade. Okay. I'll move back a little bit. All right? Or not. I have complete trust in you, Jerry. First time I heard Jerry play guitar down at the House of Blues with his band, I decided to uh, accept Jerry into my heart as my personal guitar player. <laughs> and he's been, he's been my personal guitar player ever since. Anyway, this is uh, my first chance to speak here. And guys, this is phenomenal. Isn't this the coolest place on earth? It's just, what a wonderful environment. You know, if the, if the message gets boring, look at what you get to look at. It's, it's fantastic. Anyway, this is a series, a message in the series on the Holy Spirit. Adrena, stop it. I've got the traffic over here, I got the fountains burgling over here, and I got you already starting to laugh at mediocre jokes. What happens when I get really funny? 
then we're totally out of control. It's good to see you, Adrian. <laughs> Truly good to see you here. Anyway, this is a Holy Spirit message. I want to dive right in. The title of this message is The Holy Spirit In and On. I want you to keep in mind two things, in and on. And what this is referring to is the internal work of the Holy Spirit and the external work of the Holy Spirit. And they're two very different things. Here's the external. We can sum this up very quickly in one verse, Acts 1.8. And this is Jesus speaking to his followers, his disciples, before he's going to return to heaven. And he says this, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. This is the external expression of the power of God in your life. The Holy Spirit comes upon you and something happens. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Now the people he was talking to, his disciples, they had absolutely no problem understanding what he was talking about. This idea of, of an external power coming upon you and expressing the power of God through you into the world, into the lives of others. This was common. This is what they understood the Holy Spirit to do because this is what the Holy Spirit did in the Old Testament. And remember, when Jesus is saying this, they don't have the New Testament. All they have is the Old Testament, the history of the Jewish people. Now, this is interesting, folks. The... the uh, There's the Old Testament. That's the fat part. Okay? There's the New Testament. That's the thin part. In that entire Old Testament, with the exception of three times, three times in that entire book, it speaks of the Holy Spirit doing something inside of you. Every other time in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit is a power that comes upon you. So they understood what he was saying when he said, the Spirit will come upon you. They were thinking of the Old Testament. Boy, this is going to be like Moses. This is going to be like Joshua. This is going to be like the prophets. They got that. It works like this. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit comes upon you. He does something powerful. And then he says goodbye. It's not a relationship. It's an empowering. He blows in, he blows up, and he blows out. It's external because it's coming from outside doing something. It's an experience. It's an experience of power, of God's power. That's the external. Now here's the internal, and this is really interesting. In the New Testament, the language changes. Something is added in the New Testament that they had no clue of before it happened to them. The New Testament language Instead of it just being coming upon, it's now dwelling within. There's a whole new concept of the Holy Spirit that's introduced in the life of the church. It's a new work of the Holy Spirit. And it's internal. And it goes to the deepest depths of your identity and your personality. God is going to do something through His Spirit which is going to transform you. Your self-image will change. Your understanding of yourself will change. Your experience of God will change. It changes literally your identity. It is a new capacity for a new kind of life because it's a genuine change of your identity. And this is the heart of what it means when we say life in the Spirit, living in the Holy Spirit. This is the essence and the center of what it is. And here is the biblical passage from the New Testament that adequately, I think, perfectly describes this new work. And this is Romans 8, 14 to 16. And man, if you've been a Christian more than 15 minutes, you've probably heard this passage. But it bears saying it again. Those who are led by the Spirit of God are the... What's the word he uses? Those who are led by the Spirit of God are the something of God. Children. They're the children of God. There's this new identity that the Holy Spirit is coming to give. And Paul goes on to elaborate. He says, you know, the Spirit you receive, it doesn't make you a slave. So that you live in fear again. See, in the Old Testament, you lived under the fear of the judgment of the law. But in the New Testament, with this new work of the Holy Spirit, you don't have to fear that. 
Righteousness and goodness is now living inside of you. You have a new power to be good living inside of you. And you can trust it. And he says, the spirit you received brought about your adoption into sonship. The spirit makes you a child of God. Adopts you into the DNA of God so that you just don't have his last name. You are his last name. You're a child of God. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. Term of intimate endearment. And the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we're God's children. This is the deepest work God can do. Is when he assures you in the center of your personality, in the heart of your identity, you are God's well-loved child. Can you imagine the security that comes into your life when you know you're God's well-loved child? You're not a loser anymore. You don't have to struggle under a spirit of perfectionism and self-judgment. No, your identity's changed. You're a child of God. You're grafted into his family. You have his DNA flowing within you. His spiritual DNA is now your spiritual DNA. It's, 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 it's like, listen, people honest to God, it's the greatest thing that can happen to you when that experience happens to you. You are different. From that moment forward, you are transformed. And every gift that we experience in life comes from this foundational change of identity. This is the heart of the matter. It is the quintessential definition of life in the spirit is this understanding of who you are as God's child. And the Holy Spirit provides experiential evidence within you that this has happened to you. When that happens to you, you will understand what I'm talking about. And if it hasn't happened to you, and this is not a statement of judgment, this is a statement of love. If this hasn't happened to you, you need it to happen to you. Because it's like going from a black and white world to a world of color. It's an amazing transformation. And it's not an idea, it's an experience. So I'm going to tell you my story to illustrate this, this inner work. I'm going to start with the inner work in my life. I was a hard-working evangelical. I came to become a Christian because my life lacked purpose. I needed purpose. I saw this as a way to have purpose. I went after it. I worked hard in the church. I worked harder than anybody else. I was doing a job as a lawyer at the same time as I was uh, planting a church. And it was exhausting. It was absolutely exhausting. And I was deeply frustrated. But I didn't, I didn't know what the answer was to my exhaustion. I thought being a Christian was do more, try harder. Just get on, just get up, get to work. And when things lag a little, just do a little more work. The answer was always do more and pray more. Do more and pray more. Do more and pray more. That was my understanding of being a Christian. I'll tell you what, you live that way, it's devastating. It's like just grinding something down. I went to a meeting of pastors and uh, church leaders. We met in a Catholic convent. We, we met in the, in the lower floor of a Catholic convent. The building had been there over 100 years. And we're down there in that room talking about how to do more and try harder. I'm thinking, why am I here? And uh, the second morning, the guy running the meeting said, we're going to invite one of the Catholic sisters to come down here and just tell us the history of their order in this building and how they came to the city. That sounds boring. So they invited, who later became for me Sister Nora, they invited her into the room. I get this, okay? Do more, try harder, no spiritual experience of God, just a Christian to be a Christian because it's better than not being a Christian. Are you with me? That's my identity. I don't know the Holy Spirit. I got no clue what he does. There's God the Father, God the Son, and there's a bird. That's it. And the bird is scary, and you, you should be staying away from him. That's pretty much the message I got in my past. Be careful. He's weird. You never know what he's going to do next. It's best if you just leave him alone. So I left him alone. This little Catholic sister, she's 62 years old, I'm 33. She walks into the room and I, my head turns and I look at her. I start to cry. I'm a lawyer. I don't have a heart. 
It was removed on graduation day at law school. I have a wallet. I don't have a heart. And I'm tearing up. And I'm thinking, what? You know, what's, what? This is weird. This is just, this is strange. And she walks up and she starts giving this, well, you know, Father Lacombe came here in 1884 and, and then my order, the faithful companions of Jesus came and I may, they came and then this building was built. And, and I mean, I, I'm like in tears. She's doing a history lesson. And I, my heart is just breaking. And I can't understand why. And I can't take my eyes off of this woman. It's bizarre. And she walks out and leaves the room. Something inside me says, I have to talk to her. I have to talk to her. Now they told us, you don't go upstairs where the nuns are. You stay down here. This is the public area. You do not go upstairs where the nuns live and work. At noon, I snuck up there. I disobeyed and I, I snuck up the stairs so no one would see me. And I see this long hallway with office doors on both sides. And I start praying. I said, God, don't let me get caught. I said, she has to, she has to be in one of those rooms. And I walk down, she's not in the first room or the second room. I think she's in the third or fourth room on the right. I stick my head in, she's sitting there. Now, what do you say? You know, hi, I'm not supposed to be here. I need what you have. So I stuck my head in and I said the most inane thing I could possibly say. I said, the talk that you gave us this morning really meant a lot to me. <laughs> a history lesson. And she's looking at me like, these Protestants are weird people. <laughs> and she said, sit down, sit down. So we sat down, we started to talk. She started to talk about the Lord. Started to talk about Jesus. I realized she knows him. And I don't. I said, listen, when you talk about the Lord, it's like you're on a first name basis with them. And she said, yeah, I am. I said, how do you, how do, you do that? I said, I don't, I don't know him like that. How do you do that? She said, well, um, you'd have to learn to pray. <laughs> I said, okay, we're done. I said, I, I've tried the prayer thing. I do the countries of the world. I do the missionaries. I do my family. I said, I hate it. It's boring. I gave up. I quit. I don't pray. She said, I'm, that's not what I'm talking. That's not prayer. That's asking for things. I said, what are you talking about prayer? She said, well, you, you need to know how to be with God. You need to learn simply how to be with God. Not to ask him for stuff or get a job done. You just need to know how to be with him. And I was a lawyer at the time. So I cross-examined her. I said, look, are you trying to tell me that there's some process that I can go through a prayer that when it's done, I would know Jesus like you know Jesus? Is that what you're saying to me? She said, yes. I said, how do I start? She said, you come see me for an hour every week for a year. And I'll teach you how to pray. I'll teach you how to be with God. I said, man, you're Catholic. As far as I'm concerned, you guys are going to hell. <laughs> and I said, I grew up, but my elementary school was across the street from the Catholic elementary school. I said, I, I had to take a different route home down the alleys every day not to get beat up by the Catholics. I said, do you understand I shouldn't even be talking to you? She said, yeah, I understand. I said, but... Are you going to make me pray to Mary? <laughs> she said, I would never ask you to do anything that violates anything that you believe. I said, We're, okay, I'm in. She said, come on Friday. And that started the process, and, and it was horrible. She made me sit still for an hour. She made me sit still for, you, you people, you don't know the person I used to be. There was no still in my life. So she's making me do my prayers and it's punishment. An hour. I tried negotiating. I tried to get her down to 20 minutes. She wouldn't budge. She wouldn't budge. She wouldn't budge. One hour or we don't do it. I said, all right. Months go into it. 
It's been hard work. It's painful. Nothing's happening. There's no God in it. It's just, I'm just trying to learn to be still. I'm in my back room one morning. It's a TV room. TV's there and the shelf, and then there's the couch, and I'm on the floor with my back against the couch. I'd been up late the night before. I didn't sleep very well. I'm dog tired. I've got a headache, and I'm doing my prayers. I'm doing being with God. How do you do being with God? I thought you'd just be with God. So I'm trying to do everything she taught me to do, and nothing's working, and I've got a headache, and I feel terrible. And I said, God, I just hate this. I can't stand this. I said, nothing's happening. I'm not getting anything out of this. I said, I have a headache. I hurt. I just wish, this quote, said, I just wish I could crawl up into your lap and go to sleep. That's all I want. And he said, do it. This thought in my head said, do it. And I said, do what? Crawl up into your lap and go to sleep? He said, thought came again, do it. And I looked across the floor and I built this, I made this big pillow for watching TV. It's four foot by two foot stuffed with foam, about like this big pillow. And it was sitting on the other side of the room. And the thought said, go across the floor, pull out the pillow, curl up in the pillow, go to sleep in my lap. And I thought, this is bizarre. I'm a lawyer. We don't act this way. This is silly. This is childish. The thought said, do it. Crawled across the floor, pulled the pillow out, curled up in it, asleep just like that. Slept about maybe 20 minutes. Okay, what I'm going to tell you now, the words do not function for. So I'll just do the best I can. When I woke up, I was in the arms of God. I just... It was overwhelming. I was filled with this love that I had never experienced and didn't understand. All I could say over and over and over again was the word Father. I just said Father. 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 And it went on like that. And then the next day when I went to prayer, it started again. It went on like that for several months. Every time I went to prayer, it was just absolutely overwhelming. Now here's the interesting thing. I never, for a moment, thought that was the Holy Spirit. I had no clue. Didn't know the Holy Spirit. Didn't understand the Holy Spirit. Didn't get it. I knew this. God touched me with his love. And it's the most amazing thing I've ever experienced. And I want this for the rest of my life. And now I need this for the rest of my life. That's what I knew. But I didn't know it had anything to do with the Holy Spirit. I, didn't, I, didn't, I hadn't read this. I mean, I read this stuff, but I didn't understand this stuff. Now I was experiencing this stuff. That was the... That was the internal. Now I want to tell you a story about the external. Now here's the issue. Some theology says that the internal and ex external happen at the same time. That at the same time you, you, you experience the spirit of adoption, you become God's child at the same time, all of a sudden the power rushes in and boom, you're operating in amazing power. That's one theology. I can tell you that it didn't happen that way for me. And for many people I know it doesn't happen that way. I think they're two different works. I think it's possible to have the first and not have the second. I even think, and this is okay, this is whacked out, but I've got evidence for this. I think it's possible to move in the power and not have had the first one. They're two different works. Two different works of the same Holy Spirit, but they're two different works for two different purposes. You can say yes to the first and no to the second. Have the first and never have the second. God honors your choices. He's not going to bully you into something. He never does that. You can 
seek the power and move in the power and never have that identity change exist, uh, experientially manifest in your life. You, but the key is, and this is where our theology has so damaged the church, we turn these into two different political positions on the work of the Holy Spirit, and, and each camp says no to the other experience, and we end up with half of what God wants to do. It's a both. You don't just need the inner, you need the outer. You don't just need the outer, you need the inner. It's, it's all the package of what it is to be a child of God and to move in His power. You have to have both. So I was cruising along, you guys, with the inner work thinking, I have arrived. And believe me, the fruit of the Spirit was evident. The blood-sucking, wallet-extracting evil lawyer was turning into Mr. Peace and gentle 62-year-old Catholic nun. My staff thought something had happened. It's good. He's nice now. He's not selfish like he used to be all the time. There's this changed person. But oh, wow. It's pretty intense. I was cruising along in that thinking, I've arrived. This is it. This is exactly what God wants for me. Minding my own spiritual business. And my mentor... He's doing his doctorate at Fuller Seminary. And he's taking a class by John Wimber on signs and wonders in church growth. It's a technical class about how the power of God can influence the growth of a church. See, what happened was John Wimber was a church growth pastor, at, at uh, should say a professor at Fuller Seminary. And he was listening to his stories of return missionaries from all over the world. Return missionaries coming back on a furlough, taking some time at Fuller. And they're telling these stories of signs and wonders breaking out all over the place. And people becoming Christians in droves and churches doubling in, in, in six months. He's hearing these stories principally about physical healing. And he says an interesting thing to himself. Why doesn't it happen here? How come all these stories from the third world, how come we're not seeing this here? It's a legit question, right? So he, you got you to gotta love risk-taking guys who are willing to just take chances. He's, he's a successful professor at Fuller, adjunct professor, teaching a very popular class with all sorts of pastors coming to take it. And who doesn't want to grow your church, right? Just give me the secret formula and I'll do it. But he decides, you know, th let's experiment. Let's find out. Will this, will this signs and wonders things, this healing power, will this work in our culture or is it only in the third world? So he decides to do an experiment. He tells his class, uh, uh, his teaching, uh, his TA, teaching assistant, was my mentor who's doing his doctorate there. So he tells the TAs and he tells all the class, bring sick people to class next week. Because after I teach, we're going to have clinic. We're going to try this laying on of hands thing. We're going to try this. See if it works. So they start bringing sick people into class and they're getting healed in an academic environment without worship. Sorry, Josh, but the spirit can move even without worship. And my... My, my mentor phones me. And okay, you got to understand my mentor. He has a brain the size of a truck and no emotional life whatsoever. I'm not, I'm not he, if he were here, he'd be telling you the same thing. We used to call him God's Clint Eastwood. You know, fist full of dollars or whatever. So, So he calls me and he said, you won't believe what I'm seeing in the classroom. Now he's like been Mr. Straight Up Evangelical. He's not into the Holy Spirit at all. He said, you won't believe what's happening in the class. I said, what are you talking about? He said, let me tell you about the healing I saw last week. Let me tell you about the healing from the week before that. He said, I'm laying my hands on people and they're getting, they're getting healed. And see, this is tilt now. Because I'm a secessionist at this point. I don't believe these gifts are for today. They passed away. They're done. We finished the canon of scripture. The, scripture, the Bible got printed. That's it. You know, done. 
We don't need these signs and wonders things anymore. And he's telling me these, these healings, these signs and wonders things are happening in his classroom. And I wouldn't believe it from anyone but him because he's so cynical. As you know, he's so cynical. So when he says this stuff is happening, um, yeah, it must be. He says, you gotta get down here, you gotta see this. You need to get down here, 1984. You need to come down. I said, we're coming. Because if this Book of Acts stuff he's talking about is real, then I want to see it. I want to know it. I want to test it out. So we go down there, my then wife, we go down there and we're staying with him. And he says, we're going to church tonight. Okay? I'm a Canadian. We have a certain view of church. You dress the right way. You act the right way. There's no emotional exuberance. It's Canadian, okay? It's just Canadian. So we go to this church in Anaheim. There's 3,000 young people there. They're all in board shorts. They all got ratty hair. I can't understand what they're talking about because it's all gnarly and it's tubular. It's all surfer talk. So people are milling around, thousands of them, and up on the stage there's this band, and I'm a musician. I was in a band at the time. We traveled, we toured, we did all sorts of stuff. So music is big to me. And my idea of church music sucks. It's not really good music. This band starts to play. It's so good, I can't believe it. Like this band rocks, and they're really, really good. And there's this big fat guy in a Hawaiian shirt playing this grand piano, and he's, he's really good. Turns out he's John Wimber, the pastor of the church. So I'm already on board with the, this music, this worship. They get in about the second song, and something goes off inside of me, you guys, which I'd never experienced before, is getting to the end of the song, and I'm inside, I'm going, I want to scream and yell and jump up and down. As soon as the song's over, I want to scream and yell and jump up and down. I've never done that in my life. But this pressure of celebration or something just God, it's blowing up inside of me. But the left side of my, the lawyer side of my brain says, this is a church. We don't behave that way here. We're self-controlled and respectful. So this war is going on. The end of the song comes and everybody around me goes nuts. They're screaming and yelling and jumping up and down and all of a sudden, I am too. And this explosion of worship which I've never experienced before just went off inside of me like this is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. And then the pastor ends a mediocre sermon which I judged harshly because I'm an intellectual and the fat guy isn't. And so I'm just being, I'm just being a typical lawyer. And he finishes, he says, now we're going to have clinic. And I turned to Ken and I said, what's clinic? And he said, oh, you're going to like this. Just watch this. So I'm looking around. Well, clinic is an exercise in chaos. Everybody gets up out of their seat and they start praying for someone around them. Total strangers. They just breaks. Can you imagine ruining church by turning it into a prayer meeting? They turned it into a prayer meeting. Not just praying, but they were laying hands on one another. And strange things were happening. And people were laughing. And some people were crying. And I'm, I'm like the Canadian with the, the, the huge eyes just looking around going, this is not like any church I've ever been to before. And a kid, about 16 years, I'm about 33, no, I'm, 30, I'm later, I'm older than that, 30 something, mid 30s. And this teenage kid comes up to me in his surfer lingo and says, hey man, I have a word from the Lord for you. And I am so arrogant. I just thought, no, you don't. You think you do, but you don't. But I'm, I'm a Canadian, so we're terminally polite. So I said, well, you know, go ahead. Like, I'm thinking, I'm honestly, at that point, I'm thinking, this is going to take about 10 minutes with this kid, and then we get to go home, and I'm tired, and we can go to, go to bed. And he starts giving me the word of the Lord. And he's telling me what's going on in my heart with God. And it's 100% accurate. And I get really, really angry. 
Because I realize this is real. This is true. What he's doing right now with me, this is God. I can, I know it's God. There's no question. And I was so mad at God. I was just furious with him. I said to him, I had a mental image in my mind. I saw myself crawling across the desert with a little vial of water about this big, clutching it because it's all I've got to keep me alive. And I'm crawling across the desert. I'm seeing this in my mind's eye. And then I see these kids at this church in their stupid board shorts and their ratty hair. And there's this big fountain right in the middle of the church with a wall about this high and filled with water. And they're jumping in and out of the water. The water is the Holy Spirit. And they're spilling it on the floor. And I'm, I'm, I'm crawling across the desert with a little vial of water to, to save my life is all I have. And these kids are wasting the presence of God. And I got so angry. I said, God, this is not fair. I said, I work hard for you. I've knocked myself out for you. And these irresponsible morons are treating your substance, your water, like it's something to play with. They don't know that it's precious. Why do they have it? And I don't. Now, what I just went through there, that was biblical. That's the older brother. I'm judging these kids because they're enjoying God. And I'm angry because I'm not. Not like they are. I had my love thing going, but it had no power, no supernatural edge. It's just this good love thing. And I was angry and I said, God, I want this. I don't care what it takes. Give it to me. And I went home that night to Ken's place in Pasadena. We sat down at the kitchen table. He was doing his doctorate on physical healing. Wrote a book, translated in 26 languages, gone to seminaries all over the world. Huge influence. I said, tell me everything you know about physical healing right now. Right now. And he did. He, this is my thesis. He outlined the points. And I memorized. I, I used to have almost a photographic memory. I, I memorized everything he said. I came home the next Sunday. I was on the teaching roster at church. The next in an evangelical church with no experience of any Holy Spirit, anything. And I chose to speak on physical healing. And I taught everything that he taught me on that evening. And I downloaded it to the church. And I had the audacity to say... And next Sunday at so-and-so's house, we're going to have a healing meeting. And if you're sick, you come. And if you want to know how to pray for the sick, you come and get trained. We're going to experience the power of God. And the next Sunday, people came that I didn't even expect. And a girl came. She had a respiratory, rare respiratory infection that the doctor told her. Special says it's going to take at least six months to a year of, of nothing but rest to get over this. There's no cure for it. We're just gonna have to rescue. He told her not to work anymore. She quit. She took a furlough from work. She shows up at the meeting and I'm teaching on physical healing. This power starts to stir inside of me. And I looked at her and I said, Laurel, do you wanna be well? And she said, yes. And I said, in the name of Jesus, be healed. That's all I knew to do. And nothing apparent happened. That was a Sunday night, Sunday afternoon. On Tuesday, she went to see her specialist. She was sitting in the lobby in his office. And he walked through and he looked at her and he said, Laurel, you look like sunshine. What's happened to you? And she said, I've been healed. And he said, come in, we better talk about this. So they went to the office and he heard the story. And he said, well, you look different. She said, I want to go back to work. I've been healed. He said, look, I shouldn't send you back to work, but we'll do this because you seem convinced. I will send you back. But if you have one symptom, one evidence of any, any of the symptoms we've been dealing with, you come back, you're not working anymore. She never went back to the doctor. She was instantly and completely healed. And that started a flow of the Holy Spirit in our church that radically changed the church. We were seeing healings regularly, people being filled with the Spirit. Prophecy began, spontaneously broke out. We ended up planning a church. It doubled in size the first year, doubled in size the second year, doubled in size the, size the third year. Greatest roller coaster ride of my life. Never had this much fun. 
The Holy Spirit wants to do that wherever he is welcomed. And here's the lessons, two lessons out of this storytelling adventure. Follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts. Follow the way of love and be neutral about spiritual gifts. Follow the way of love and don't bother with them. They're scary and they're supernatural and they're weird. Follow the way of love, just be a nice person and don't take any real interest in the transformation of the people's lives around you because you really don't have the power to make a difference anyway. So just be cavalier about spiritual gifts and just handpick the ones you like that won't embarrass you and forget the ones that might embarrass you and that's the way to live the powerful Christian life, not. No. Not. No. No, eagerly desire spiritual oh. gifts. And not just one or two of them, ask for all of them. Yeah. Make it a passionate pursuit. I'm just quoting Paul here. Make it a passionate pursuit of the highest value that you will be a person filled with the Holy Spirit, empowered to change the lives of others because the Holy Spirit's flowing through you. You can live a supernatural lifestyle. You don't have to settle for just being a nice person. You can be a nice and powerful person. Listen, my encounter with the spirit of adoption through Sister Nora came because I eagerly desired to know Jesus like she knew Jesus. My experience of the Holy Spirit in Anaheim that led to the change of our church in Canada came because I saw something that was real and I wanted it and I'm prepared to take a risk to get it. I want it more than anything. And I'll do whatever it takes to get it. Eagerly desire, listen, apart from certain tragedies, which come because we live in a far, fallen world, apart from certain and, and, and infrequent tragedies, you get as much of God as you want. Let me say it again. You get as much of God as you have desire for. He doesn't force himself on you. If you don't desire it, it isn't going to happen. So listen, fan the flames of your desire. Think about what your life would look like if you were moving as if your identity was solid as God's child because he's witnessed his love to you and you have opened yourself to the power of the Holy Spirit and you are now open to doing anything, anytime, anywhere with anyone that honors the Lord and takes a risk. Be ready to risk. Risk is the key. John Wimber, remember a sermon he taught, I was there, he said, we talk a lot about faith. He said, faith is the key. Yes, it is. Biblically, faith is important. But he said, I spell faith R-I-S-K. If you will take risks, you will see the power of God flowing through you. If you play it safe, you won't. Well, yeah, I mean, once in a while, but not as a lifestyle. We need a lifestyle of power, and that is dependent on faith, which we can spell risk. My prophetic gifting started because I was in a meeting where a prophet was prophesying and it was profound. I'd never seen anything like it. And I went up to him at the break and I said, teach me how to do that. I want to do what you're doing. Teach me how to do that. He said, when we start again in 15 minutes, come and stand beside me. As I prophesy, thoughts will come into your mind. Share them with me and I'll tell you if they were from God. If they're from God, you're going to give them to the person. I thought, this sounds easy. Just... See what pops into my head. Guys, within about two or three minutes, thoughts were popping into my head and it was God and it started a prophetic ministry that's gone on to this day. Why? Because I desired it. Because I'm willing to look stupid for the sake of maybe getting this thing that I really want. There's got to be a way we can inflame our desire. There's got to be a way we can increase our desire for more of God. Really, all we're talking about is more of God. We're just talking about more of God in any way and every way that he wants to express himself. Now, this is not manipulative. You understand? That was a passionate message, which I hope inflames more desire. But what we're going to do now is not manipulation, and I don't want you to take it that way. But I'm giving you now an invitation. 
If you want more of the power of God to you, identifying your childhood in Him, your identity, and you want more of His power flowing through you, I would like you to stand up. And I don't want you to stand up because it's the right thing to do. I only want you to stand up if in this moment, this is something that you can say, yes, I really want. Okay? All right. Let's open our hands like we're going to receive something from Him because we're going to receive something from Him. That's critical. You open your hands to receive because He's going to give you something now. Father, eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy, to speak your words for others, to see their lives change. Passion. Holy Spirit, come and inflame our passions for more of you. Waken our hunger for more of you, Lord. Give us a desire for more of you in our lives. Make it a feeding frenzy, Lord. Make it a desperate thing where we just want you more than anything. We want more of you more than anything. Inflame our passions. Holy Spirit, fuel our passions with your power and your love. Now receive to say yes. Now the Lord wants to give you His Holy Spirit now. He wants to increase the measure of what is living within you, increase the experience of what is already there so that it becomes more and more normal to you and you can take more and more risks and see more and more happen. He wants to give you more power. Right now we're on power. We're not on, we're not on the identity issue right now. We're on the power issue. Do you want more of His power flowing through you? Yes. Then receive it. In the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ, right now. Right now, Holy Spirit, fill us with more power. More of your presence, Lord. More of your power through us for others. Come, Holy Spirit, fill us right now. Now pay attention. Pay attention to what's going on inside of you right now. Pay attention to what's happening in your physical body. Pay attention to what's happening in your heart, in your emotions. Pay attention to the thoughts that are coming into your mind right now. Just take note. What's happening? Holy Spirit, what are you doing right now? To me, what are you doing to me right now? What's your will? What do you want for me right now? If you're feeling something physical, physical sensation in your body. Put your hand up. More. More, Lord, right now. Those people with their hands up, right now. More. More, Holy Spirit. Witness. More. Deeper. Witness to them, Lord. Come with more power. Fill them up, Lord Jesus. Holy Spirit, I'm asking you to do something special right now, Lord. Holy Spirit, please... Please tell them right now what this power is for. Which gift is it? Which gift or gifts are you empowering in them right now in this moment as they're sensing your presence? Speak it to them, Lord, so that they know what to go after and what to begin risking for. For some of you, it's prophecy. Shake your hand if it's prophecy. Okay. More impartation of prophecy. If it's physical healing flowing through you to others, Shake your hand. More, Lord, more physical healing for those that are sick around us. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Gifts of faith. Gifts of faith. He wants to increase. There's, there's, there's normal faith and then there's special gifts of faith for special purposes. More of those special gifts of faith, for Lord, for special purposes. Holy Spirit, more of that faith. John, can you think of any other particular gifts that he wants to emphasize today? I want to say this, that when I started this church, the Lord gave me a vision in my mind and I saw the congregation and there were flames of fire on every head. 
And the interpretation was that was a, the gifts of the Holy Spirit have been activated in every single member of the church. People have been saying independently that this is a new beginning for us. I keep hearing that. It's a new start. It's a new beginning. This is a fresh outpouring. Every one of us need to receive a fresh gift of the Holy Spirit. And there are two really important reasons. One, if you've never received Jesus as your Savior, you need to do that. I want to be right up here. And I want you to come up here when uh, we start praying for the sick. If you never received Jesus Christ, you, that's the door. He's the door into the Father's house. You cannot get to God any other way than through Jesus. So I'm going to ask you, if you never received Jesus, to meet me up here. But the power, the reason why we must be more than nice people is because Satan is destroying people's lives with sickness and disease and oppression and discouragement and lies. The Bible says that Jesus came for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. You need the gifts of the Spirit flowing through you to destroy the works of the devil. He's not nice, and we don't need to be nice either when it comes to destroying his works. Okay. Two, we do two things. Oh, yeah, this is good. It just became clear. Um, anyone here with a condition, sickness of any, any form, would you come up into this area right here if you would like healing? Yeah, let's start destroying the works of the devil. Come, come on, on church. Any kind of physical condition at all, any kind of sickness or chronic condition, and you want prayer for it, please come up now. I just saw asthma. Uh, somebody have asthma. Come up and uh, come over Come over here. If that's you, raise your, just raise your hand. That's me. I just saw it. Yeah, I just saw it right in the lungs. I saw the lungs. That's called a word of knowledge where the Lord will show you something spontaneously. Any other asthma? Uh, over here. Okay, so we're going to start this way. Thank you for being honest and vulnerable to allow us to pray for you. What we're going to do now is every one of you that had a sense that I want to see sick people healed, I want that ministry, I want, I want that work of, of healing, and you want to pray for the sick, I'd like you to come and stand behind these people or to the side of these people and just don't touch them, but just stretch so you out guys your come hand. Closer. Those yeah, who, come on up. Those who need a miracle of healing, come closer. That's good right there. A little bit of room behind them is the prayers. Now all the prayers, come on and, and just get get where you can get close enough that you can stretch out your hand at a, at a social distancing distance. And we're going to begin praying for physical healing now. And the power, listen, the Holy Spirit is not limited to space and time. The Bible says the lightning comes out of the hands of God. They will come out of your hands because you're his vessel now. Okay, stretch out your hand. Find someone to pray for right now. And let's pray. Asthma. It is not your In the all-powerful name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we accept this ministry of Jesus. We accept this ministry of healing. We welcome you, Holy Spirit, to come right now and manifest the gift of healing. Healing come in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to every person who's standing here. That vertigo be gone in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Tinnitus be gone in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Energy, restored energy. Fatigue, chronic fatigue be gone in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. And headaches, migraine headaches be gone in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Chronic infections be gone in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Cancer be gone in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, Lord, right, right now, we release, in the all-powerful name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we release healing to Hope right now. We release healing to Sebastian right now. We release healing to Maru right now. In the all-powerful name of the Lord Jesus Christ, come and kill cancer. Kill cancer, Holy Spirit. Restore health. Depression. There's several people here been fighting with chronic depression. Those are the lies of the enemy belittling your worth. In the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ, depression, shut up and be gone. Now we're going to pray for that spirit of adoption, that deep identity, that deep witness within, I am God's well-loved child. I belong. And this is the salvation piece as well. You become a son or a daughter of God through Jesus and Jesus alone. There's no other way. 
you've never received Jesus, we pray over this. The spirit of adoption, the Bible called becoming a son or daughter of God. I want you to come up right now. Don't be embarrassed. Don't be ashamed. Don't be fearful. Don't let your, your own insecurities stop you. You come right up here, right over by me here, and you're going to give your life to Jesus. And you're going to feel the spirit of adoption, the spirit of the Son of God come into your soul. And you're going to experience His peace, His salvation, His forgiveness. And that's you just begin to move this way. And uh, I'm going to pray for you for your salvation. Now, there's a number of you here that had the same thing I had, which is that I'm a Christian because I do more and try harder. And you're on that treadmill of performance, and it's just, it never ends. In fact, it gets worse. The treadmill just tips up a little bit more all the time. You have to do more to accomplish less. Pretty soon, it's just tedious. It's just hard. We need to be taken off the treadmill and into his arms. Where it's not hard to, to be his... See, it's, it can be hard to be his servant, but it's not hard to be his child. You're just his child because he's your father. Your identity, you're not a servant anymore. Listen, you need to, some of you need to hear this. Linda, you need to hear this. You're not his... You're, you, you, Jesus said, I no longer call you servant. I call you friend. You're his friend. You're not, you're not working for him, you're working with him. It's a change of identity. Many of you need that mentality lifted off. As, uh, my faith is working for God. No, your faith is living with God. And in the, in, the, in the process of living with God, a lot of the time I'm just with Him. We're not working, we're living. And sometimes we do some hard work together, and that's good. Because He loves everyone and He wants to send us. But our identity is not as the worker. Our identity is as the child. Now, if you need that right now, and these words are echoing in your spirit, in your uh, your identity, you're saying, God, I'm so sick and tired of the treadmill. I'm so sick and tired of seeing myself as something that works for you. And you want that change. Open your hands right now. We're going to pray. Holy Spirit, you love to do this. I think it's your favorite thing. I really do sense it's your favorite thing. That you would deliver now to each one of these people, to each one of us, the spirit of adoption. It says, you're my well-loved child. You're my